Fisheye photography is a lot of fun. It introduces new perspectives and new challenges for photographers. I've been using fisheye lenses ranging from 10mm to 17mm and always enjoyed the experience, not just as a novelty with curved lines or curved horizons, but also for more conventional looking ultra wide angle views where the fisheye effect is not immediately apparent. However, I've often wondered what it would be like to use a lens that produces the classic circular fisheye look. So, I was rather pleased when seven artisans contacted me and asked whether I'd like to try their new 4mm fisheye lens designed for crop sensors. 4mm really does sound like an extreme and fascinating perspective. The lens has a 225 degree angle of view. I'm going to be using an E-mount version of the lens. Seven Artisan also makes the lens for other mounts. I'm not being paid to post this review, by the way, but they're letting me keep the lens after I finished. And it's a fine looking lens at first sight, with that beautifully curved front element and the solid metal mount. The first thing I learnt about the lens is how easy it is to touch the front element, like I've just done inadvertently here. I'm using the lens on a Sony A6000, where it's small and well balanced. But before discussing the details, let's get straight on to seeing the view this lens produces. Here's a photo from the Sony in its kit lens at its widest angle at 16mm. And here's the same view with the 4mm fisheye lens. I don't know what your first reaction is to this, but mine was wow, exactly what I was hoping to see. I also took a video comparing 16mm with the circular fisheye view, scanning around from the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben to the London Eye. and a photo of the ceiling of Westminster Abbey, indoors and handheld. The lens has captured the front and back and both sides of the Abbey and produced an image no other lens I've owned could possibly create. But what is it really like to use a lens like this? It's certainly an interesting challenge. And how well does it perform optically? It's not an expensive lens. I've spent more on vintage fish eyes and it produces unique circular perspectives. But is it really worth buying one just for this circular look? or are there other ways you can use it? These are the main questions I'm going to cover in this video. The lens itself is nice and compact and seems very well made. It feels good and the rings are well damped. It's a fully manual lens with manual focusing and it has an aperture ring with settings going from f2.8 to f16. I particularly like this handle for moving aperture ring. It comes in very handy when you want to change the f-stop and it makes the operation so much easier. With a front element as exposed as this, you have to be careful in how you treat the lens and be diligent in using the lens cover. Plus, I always carry a soft lens cloth to clean the front. As I mentioned at the start, the lens has a 225 degree angle of view, and this provides a fascinating view through the viewfinder. For example, take this photograph of a railway station. You can see both ends of the railway line. You'd expect that with a 180 degree view. However, to the left and right and towards the top, you can also see the wall that's behind where we're sitting. In other words, the lens is capturing things that are actually behind where I'm holding the camera. This view of the London Eye shows how much you can play with the 225 degree perspective. I can rotate this image all the way around and it's still hard to tell which way up I was holding the camera. Now, when I first saw the results of the lens on my computer screen, aside from the circular fisheye perspective, two things became immediately apparent. Firstly, there's a frame around the image, and this frame has different colours and looks, depending on the scene being photographed and the light coming through the front elements. I actually like this look, and I've been using the framing for creative effects. I'll go into this, as well as cropping out these frames in more detail later. The second thing you'll notice is that my fingers, especially the fingers I use to press the shutter button, are in the frame, and that's if I hold the camera in a normal way. And if you're focusing the lens when you take the photograph, then your other fingers will appear also in view, as this video shows. I'm not deliberately putting my fingers in front of the lens, I'm simply turning the focus ring in the way I normally do. Your focusing hand is not such an issue, because you can take your left hand away from the lens before taking a photo, but pressing the shutter button is an issue. If you do this holding the camera in the normal way, your fingers will, more often than not, show in the border. You can also inadvertently get your head or body or feet or shadow in the frame, but this is a more normal hazard of using extreme fish eyes and something you need to take account of when composing an image or incorporate them into the composition.
But with the fingers pressing the shutter button, a significant number of my early snaps have my right hand fingers in view. So I needed to change the way I held the camera, and in particular how I pressed the shutter button. My first technique was to bring my hand as far back behind the camera as possible by pressing the shutter button with my second and not index finger. You can see this technique in this selfie. It feels a little strange and crabby to shoot like this, and you're still in danger of including your hands or your clothes or sleeves in the frame. My second technique has been to hold the camera away from the body at arm's length. This works if you're careful with how you hold the camera, but it's not a foolproof technique. My fingers still got in the way sometimes. The third technique, and the one I'm finding most successful, is to use the two-second timer on the camera. I press the shutter button, and then take my fingers away from the shutter button and the side of the camera body. I can still hold the camera up to my eye for composing the shot, but my fingers tend not to appear anymore. You could also use a tripod, but as I like to use this lens as a walk-around lens, it's not optimal to carry a tripod, even a small one with a small tripod head. It needs to be small not to show in the image. And putting the camera on a wall, for instance, well, you'll get the wall in the image too. And at this point, I should reiterate that if you accidentally have your fingers or clothes or feet or head in the frame, you can always crop them off in the image, as we'll see later. The lens's minimum focusing distance is 0.085 of a meter, so it's very close. And this opens up some creative composition opportunities. Ordinarily, I'd say that focusing is not much of an issue with fisheye lenses, beyond very close-up shots. You can set the lens all the way around to infinity and snap away. For this particular lens, I find it quite sensitive to focusing at longer distance subjects, and by that I mean you still need to check the focus for buildings that are quite a distance away. Setting the lens to infinity all the way around the scale does not guarantee a sharp focus on buildings, for example. You often need to bring back the focus ring a little to get the buildings in focus. So thank goodness for the magnified focus support on the Sony, because I use it quite a lot with this lens. I'd struggle to focus without the magnification. The aperture goes from f2.8 to f16 with a clickless aperture ring on the lens. The question with f-stops on extreme fish eyes is how much of a difference does the f-stop actually make to the images? Well, not really much of a difference for narrow depth of field bouquet type shots. I've used fish eyes at 11 to 17 millimeters for close up, narrow depth of field shots with blurred backgrounds, but not really with this lens. You can definitely see more blurring wide open, as I can demonstrate with these two photos, taken at wide open and stop right down. But it's not a standout bouquet feature at 4 millimeters. There's too much going on in the frame. The faster wide open f-stops are of course helpful for lower light situations, and the lens is sharp enough wide open. It's not too soft. Indeed, as you can see in these two photos, there's not a huge difference in sharpness at the center between wide open and stop down. Stop down and the image sharpens up nicely away from the center, but that's not entirely surprising given the changing depth of field. You can see the border to border sharpness if I zoom into a few of my shots. It's fair to say that sharpness closer to the borders is undoubtedly compromised by the lens's distortion, but that's the price you pay for such an extreme angle of view. This is a handheld shot from Westminster Abbey, and the lenses perform very well in these conditions. For closer up shots with photos like these, I want to be able to read the lettering, and the letters are nice and clear. As are the names in this shot if I zoom into various parts of the image. And for extreme close-ups, here's a sharp snap taken with one of the leaves of this yellow flower almost touching the front of the lens. If you nail the focus and the exposure, this lens is certainly good enough to take more detailed crops, even from crop sensor files. And this is an important consideration, as you may want to crop inside the circle on occasions. Colours are good too, especially on a fine sunny day with lots of blue skies, the kind of perfect conditions for a fisheye. And here are a few examples of images taken in different conditions. Unlike some other fish eyes I've used, that tend to blow out bright fluffy clouds on sunny days, this lens and its coatings handles high contrast scenes rather well. However, there is one quirk I should mention with the lens on my Sony. I typically use the lens on the A setting, so I allow the camera to do the work after I've focused and selected the f-stop. I notice that the camera occasionally overexposes images in certain conditions. 
I think this must be because the sensor is trying hard to interpret and adjust to all the light coming in, most noticeably, where there's a lot of light and a lot of darker shadows. The camera seems to overcompensate, and therefore overexpose. I should stress this doesn't happen very often, but I did find myself checking the exposure results, and then, if necessary, switching to the manual exposure mode to dial down the exposure. Nothing very taxing, especially if you're used to using manual lenses. Returning to the f-stops, aside from border-to-border -border sharpness, another big advantage from stopping down is it gives you much better defined starbursts. The documentation that comes with the lens warns about the dangers of pointing the lens straight at the sun, and that is an important message, but I did have a lot of fun photographing the sun towards the edges of the frame. And at night, using a tripod, you can produce some good starbursts too. With a reminder to keep my head out of the way. The lens's coating handles the sun pretty well, as you can see. And this is what the same scene looks like when the lens is wide open. The lens doesn't seem to produce a great deal of purple fringing within the image itself, compared to some other fisheyes I've used that are purple fringing monsters at wider open stops. Looking at stop right down shots, the lens doesn't produce extravagant flare artifacts or shapes, unlike some other fisheye lenses. I've not been able to get anything like this level of action from the lens. Yes, it certainly does produce flares in extreme situations, and I've used a detail extraction tool here to accentuate those flares. However, the lens doesn't produce so many artifacts or shapes. On balance, I'm not sure it would help to have a lot of artifacts or shapes in the picture. I think it would clutter up the circular image too much. And actually, I found more creative ways to use the flares the lens does produce. Because what the lens does do is produce different colours and fringing around the edges of the circle, as you've already seen. You can, of course, crop these effects off if you don't like the look. Cropping the circle may also be a good thing if you don't want to see your fingers or other parts of your body in the frame, if they're there. I've cropped the borders for a number of images in this video, using Adobe Photoshop. And there are other options for covering up the border, including something as simple as putting a black border on top of the image, or adding a vignette to the border, as I've done here. Another option is to crop the image into a conventional square or rectangular shape. You can become a little too familiar with the circular fisheye look after a while, but this doesn't mean you have to stick with the circular look. As long as the image is of high enough quality and resolution, it's not an issue cropping it, and these images are good for cropping. As with all fisheyes, you just need to be careful with lining up horizons and so on. I have no problem taking this lens on holiday as a walk-around lens and using it as a very wide-angle lens, cropping off the circular effect. Returning to the border effect on circular images, this is something I've spent quite a lot of time playing with. I wasn't really expecting this look. I hadn't given it much thought before using the lens. I guess I expected the border to be jet black, like a cutout. But on reflection, it's quite understandable. It's an interesting challenge to try and incorporate the colours and fringing into the overall image, and to my eyes it can add value to the image. Anyway, armed with this knowledge, I started to have fun playing with the border effects and the reflected light around the border, sometimes outside the border. Because if you position the sun in the right spot, the lens will flare across the outside of the circular frame, a little like those explosions you can see in photos of the surface of the sun. I should say I haven't done any clever processing with this image, or most other images in this video. And here are three more examples of different borders and colours the lens has produced, not just pointed into the sun, but in overcast conditions and indoors. One thing to note is that the lens does create magenta or blue fringing to the border in some bright light situations. And when the sun is pointed more directly into the lens, the flaring around the border and outside the border can be pronounced, more so when the lens is stopped down. I shouldn't have been surprised at the effects in this kind of shot. The lens is sucking in a lot of light, and in extreme situations, the light is inevitably going to bounce off the inside of the body of the lens and onto the camera's sensor. After seeing the photo of the lens flare breaking through the border, one of my favourite early images with the lens, I tried to repeat the effect, and it wasn't that hard. Trying to keep my fingers out of the frame proved harder.
And finally, what about using the lens for videos? It's a lot of fun, if a little quirky. I could imagine using the lens for good effect with families and children, and it's going to be a fun lens for drones too. But for now, I'm just experimenting with different kinds of scenes. This underground train coming into a station is a fun use of the circular look, and ironically it's actually on the circle in London. In conclusion, I very much enjoyed using this lens. It provided many interesting new perspectives and challenges, things that I welcome very much after a lifetime of taking photographs. I was slightly worried that I would quickly get bored with the circular fisheye look, but I found that wasn't the case as I experimented with looking up and looking down and close-up shots, and I found it was easy to crop the images to a conventional square or rectangular frame if I wanted to. Perhaps more tellingly, my other half, looking at the images, told me this was the first time she'd ever liked my fisheye images. She said they made her feel like she was looking inside a crystal ball, and the images were beautiful to look at. Personally, after starting to use the lens, I was a little concerned about the border framing, but in many cases you can use this to good effect, or crop it out. So I'm definitely holding on to this lens. I'll use it. I've still got some more ideas to try, and it's small enough and light enough to be a good addition to my gear. I think it's a fun lens, and great value. I'll be interested in your comments and observations about this lens, Circular Fish Eyes, in my review. And please subscribe if you haven't already done so. So until next time, all the best.